Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. Look at this thing on the bench. All right, I lied, okay? I put up a video a while ago that said it was the smallest watch that I'd ever worked on and this one has to take that crown from it. Take a look at this thing, this little tiny Rolex dress watch. This is a women's watch. This belongs to an extended family member of mine. She said, look, I, I've I had this watch since the 70s. She bought it new. She took it in and got it serviced a little while back and it ran for a while and then it stopped and she didn't want to take it back in to get serviced again. So she said, is there anything you can do? So that's what we've got on the bench this time around. You can see it's got a 14 karat gold case and uh, the bracelet is actually integrated into it. And take a look at this really cool crystal that they have on it. It's faceted around the outside edge and that gives it that kind of angular look to the light. It's really pretty and uh, it's not working. So today, we are gonna to try to fix it. As you can see, the uh, the hands can set, so that's a good step. That means that you know it can't be too bad in there, right? Take a look at it next to one of my favorite watches. This is a watch in, from my collection that's from an independent maker in Germany, and look how absurdly small this watch looks compared to it, and I'll tell you, my watch here is not that big. It is not like massive. I think it's 41 or 42 millimeters or something. I mean, this dress watch is tiny. And uh, honestly, I'm not exactly sure what to expect from it, but let's find out. Let's dig into this thing. So we've got a, sort of the basic approach here, right, is to do a service on the watch. And while you do a service, you also take it apart, right? And that means that you get a chance to see kind of what's going on with the parts and try to figure out why this watch will not work, or at least maybe why it worked intermittently. First, we'll take off the case. And as you can see, it actually comes off in one big section here, both the bracelet and the case are together. They are uh, welded together, so they're one piece. We'll set that aside. And we'll go ahead and take off the hands here to start things off. As you can see, this is just a very simple two-hand watch. There's not even a second hand on this. And that's actually fairly typical for pure dress watches, like this one is. This is a nice gold dress watch. Um, it's considered more elegant, right? There's no moving parts, it's static. It's kind of like a, a painting or something like that. A lot of dress watches have second hands too, but it's much, much more common to find dress watches that are two-handers. And uh, next we just need to get the movement out of the case here. As you can see, it's just sort of sat into the case back, so I don't think it'll be an issue. I may be able to just pull it apart. Yeah, it just comes out quite easily there. And we can take a quick look at the case back. No, well, it says Rolex on the inside and it does have a few uh, watchmakers marks, looks like just with a Sharpie this time. And we'll just set that aside and take a look at this movement for the first time. It is impossibly small. Take a look, oh, the balance wheel wants to move a little, but as you can see, it's basically the exact same thing as all the movements that I work on on this channel. It's just much smaller and much more cramped. You can go ahead and take off the dial now and that's held in place by a couple of little dial screws here those actually just impact the dial feet and hold it in place it's really quite simple okay so let's take off the dial now and there it goes dial looks like it's in pretty decent shape as well And we can put the dial in a dial holder for safekeeping, although it's like so small. <laughs> oh, okay, I guess I got an angle here and that'll keep it safe. <laughs> it's just such a tiny dial. I, yeah, these, um, these small watches are really funny. Just because they're able to make things so absolutely tiny. Let's see if my Canon pinion removal tool will work. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Pretty good. All right, so I can grab one of my movement holders and see if... <laughs> this doesn't look like it's going to fit. I'm going to put it on the smallest possible setting, and it's not even close. It <laughs> That's the smallest that thing goes. So that's not going to work. We're going to have to get rid of that, but I got lucky. Check this thing out. I got this little tiny movement holder and actually came as part of another tool that I got and they kind of threw it in there. And let's see if it goes small enough to hold this little movement. It does. 
Ah, not too bad. You know, I kept that thing around. I didn't think I would actually use it for anything. And uh, I dug it up and maybe it'll work for this. Okay, so now we can begin the disassembly process and we'll start off by taking the balance. Oh, that kind of moved. We'll take the balance off. As you can see, this looks very much like the balances that I usually work on. Oh, that movement moved again. Hmm, I wonder how good this movement holder is actually going to be. It is just kind of a cheap knockoff one that came in part of a kit for uh, for a different type of watch tool. Okay, well, this looks okay, though. We'll take the balance and we'll just set it aside. Now what? Now we can take off... The bridge that holds the train of wheels on, that seems like a fine place to start. Although before we get too deep into it, I should let down the mainspring here. This may have some wind in it, this watch, meaning it may have been wound up and since it's not running, it could still be wound up and I wanna let any pressure off of the mainspring and, in the, and on the system before I start to work on it. Let's see, oh yeah, wow, it was actually fully wound up, jeez. Okay, I'm glad I remembered to do this part. A lot of times you can get away with it even if you don't, but um, your best case scenario still isn't great. You're putting some pressure on all of the wheels and stuff down the train. And then also when you take off one of these parts here, the um, mainspring will unwind all at once and it kind of snaps unwound. And while not the end of the world, that can cause damage to it. It can break it. So we can take off the ratchet wheel now. And again, this movement, as small as it is, is basically the exact same as all the other Swiss movements of the era. This one was made by Rolex. Most movements, in fact, basically all the ones that we'll work on, they have a reference number. They have like a, you know, their own number. This one's a, a Rolex 1400. Okay, now the train wheel bridge can come all the way off and reveal the train of wheels, which are very tightly packed in. You can see there's kind of a waterfall here from this biggest wheel at the top down to the escape wheel at the bottom, which is that silver one there at the bottom. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay, well, that's fine. There's a little washer on the bottom of the crown wheel. We'll just set that aside. And in the meantime, we can take out the rest of the train of wheels. Very tight quarters here and the escape wheel comes out as well. Now we can take off the barrel bridge. Whoa! <laughs> okay, so this movement holder did not hold the movement in place and the whole thing just jumped away on me. I'll have to say I'm glad it did it here and not, uh, well, I still have the train wheels in, but that is disconcerting to say the least. We'll have to resecure it and uh, get back in there. Oh God, are you serious? Come on, stay in place. I thought this little tiny movement holder would be great. And the movement doesn't want to stay put. Oh, okay, it stayed this time. Now I can go ahead and take out that screw. You can still see the movement just doesn't feel very secure here. Yeah, and the whole thing's just gonna come out of the movement holder when I take the bridge off, really? <laughs> this thing is just unbelievable. <laughs> okay, all right. This is ridiculous. I cannot, it, apparently they don't make movement holders small enough for this, I don't know. I'm gonna try to use my hand to kind of hold it in place. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, I often talk about the types of movements that you should start with uh, if you'd like to try this hobby out. And I usually talk about using um, the big pocket watch movements. Those movements are huge by comparison. This is the opposite. 
I would not start on one of these things if you are just starting out in the hobby. <laughs> this is just a pain. It won't even stay in the movement holder. All right. Well, I finally got that barrel bridge and the barrel out of there. And now I can take off the setting lever screw. Theoretically. <laughs> okay, I'm done with this thing. Let's just uh, put it on one of my case cushions here and we'll use that as our platform because <laughs> it's just not working. Oh man. Way too small for the regular movement holder and apparently not a great fit for even the tiny one. That, that does mean that we can now take out the keyless works and continue with our disassembly. Hopefully a drama free disassembly from here on out. <laughs> okay. Last little bits here are on the uh, pallet fork. There's a pallet fork bridge and the pallet fork underneath it. It's a little bit of tight quarters here. So I just want to make sure that I'm really careful holding it in place. And there the pallet fork has come out as well. It does stick in the upper jewel, which is often a sign that the oil there has dried up and become kind of sticky. Okay, I can flip the movement over now and focus back on the keyless work. So this is on the dial side of the movement. And I'll start by taking off the setting lever spring, which is kind of a dual action part. It uh, acts as a cover plate as well as a spring. And typical to Rolex, it's very well made here. Okay, now I can take off the motion works. This is the part of the watch that controls the hands, the, the actual hands themselves. And can I get this yoke spring out without it flying away? Yeah, okay, I got it, I got it, <laughs> no problem. And that'll let me remove the yoke and the setting lever. There's a setting lever coming out now. And then this is the yoke. It's also called the return bar. A lot of watch parts have uh, multiple names. Sometimes they change over time or it's regional. Sometimes they're translated can make it a little bit confusing when you're learning. Okay, this looks fine. I can take apart the mainspring barrel and it looks like it's okay. This is called the barrel arbor and I just need to remove that and then I can take out the mainspring itself by hand, but it looks fine. There's no big gunk or mess in there and the spring itself is a modern spring. This isn't uh, one of the springs from back in the day. They kind of look almost blue. They use that kind of blued steel. And then after they came up with better metals to, to make these springs with, and they actually started calling them unbreakable mainsprings. Back in the day, there weren't as many regulations on how you advertise things. So things like unbreakable and waterproof were introduced. They're not allowed to say that kind of stuff now, unless they can meet certain requirements. Okay, so to get this thing cleaned up, let's put the uh, balance back in place for so that it's safe when we put it through the machine. Let's make sure the balance wheel spins freely. It looks pretty good there. Ooh. Hmm. Well, it spins, but it it stops way sooner than it should. Now, that could just be because this thing needs a service, like the oil or something like that. So we'll just sort of uh, store that little bit of information away as we uh, go for the watch cleaning portion of our story here. So this is the part that I think for a lot of people feels really good, right? This is the part where we clean every little bit of the watch. And to do that, I use a watch cleaning machine. This is it right here. This puts it through uh, in a little basket that has mesh so that it's suspended in the cleaning fluids, which means that parts aren't banging together. And also it of course cleans them 
by uh, the solvents and such that they're put into. So this first one is a cleaning solution. And then the next two are a rinse, but they all, you know, effectively clean. And this one actually has a feature built in where the basket goes back and forth. You can see it going one direction and then the next. A lot of times they just spin in one direction, but this one had an extra feature. And as you can see, the parts are getting cleaned. While we have a second here, I did want to say thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. I have a Patreon for this channel. If you like what I'm doing here, and you want to support it, you can find the link down in the description. Basically, it's just a way to give back to the content creators that uh, that you that you love, the things that you like here on YouTube or anywhere else, and you can find pretty much everybody over on Patreon. And I did want to say thanks to everybody who supports me there. Okay, next up, you can see there's a little bit of dirt or wear here um, in between the links on this bracelet. So I'm going to run it through the ultrasonic cleaner and uh, just give it a good cleaning. That's all I'm gonna do to it. Do to it. I'm not gonna polish anything or anything. Oh, does that bother you too? There's this bubble, in, there we go. We got the bubble and yeah, we'll just, yeah, let's just pop that bubble. There we go. And we'll just yeah, get this little bubble too. We'll just pop. Why won't it, why won't you pop little bubble? Ugh, pop. I'm gonna, no, now it's bigger. Oh my God, <laughs> now I can't pop the bigger one either. Come on, it must be the, <laughs> whatever, I give up. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be gone when we come back. Okay, it is, it is, it, it, it got popped from the ultrasonic. Boy, uh, that was a bit of an adventure. So yeah, um, the ultrasonic cleaner here will get into those little bits that you can't really get into manually and taking a look at it after it's been cleaned and the bracelet and case look absolutely gorgeous on this thing and uh, they are good to go. So with that being done, we can set it aside and take a look at the watch parts out of the watch cleaning machine. As you can see, they look absolutely gorgeous. And depending on how many of my videos you watched, you'll either say, that's everything, or wow, that's a lot of parts. It kind of depends on where you're at in your watchmaking journey. Now we can start the reassembly of this watch, and uh, we'll start by winding the mainspring back into the barrel. I do have to use a specialist tool to do this. And I love this sound, but I actually have to, this thing's so small, I have to kind of do it by hand here. There, there we go. Let's see if it sat correctly. Yes, it did, okay. So unfortunately I don't get to have that really satisfying click feeling this time, but at least we know that we safely got it put into place. Now I can put the arbor back in and then a little bit of oil here on the top just to make sure that where the lid meets that arbor that it's nicely lubricated. It, it actually unwinds extremely slowly. So this isn't like a super high friction part, but it does need to have some oil on it. And then I've got this little tool that helps you push the uh, case back, or excuse me, the lid back on top. And it's just applies pressure evenly. There's nothing special about it. You can do it with tweezers. It's just a little quicker and a little more uh, efficient to do it that way. So I'm gonna try uh, using this case cushion again to start putting everything back together. And I'm gonna start with the train of wheels. And let's see how this goes. Everything looks fine so far. I don't see any reason why this watch shouldn't run well. The movement's in good shape. The parts so far haven't shown us any wear or major issues. And I'm gonna put a little bit of oil on the center wheel here before we put it into place. And, okay, this is a problem. <laughs> so I can't push it down because it's on this cushion, which is part of the reason why we use a movement holder is so that the things can lay properly. So I'm gonna move things over now to a little staking block that I have, because it has holes in it, but also a flat surface. I really don't wanna go back to that movement holder. That thing is gonna haunt my memories, I'll tell you that. Okay, we can put the train wheel bridge back on, and again, making sure that everything is lined up. There are actually four different pivots that need to be in place before we can tack this thing down. That looks about right, though. 
That's what you want to see. You want to see kind of a smooth, gentle motion. And that looked right to me too. So with this in place, I, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with the train of wheels, at least that I've seen so far. The mainspring in its barrel seems to be in good shape and working fine as well. Now I can put the uh, setting lever screw back into place. The reason we put this on now, even though that's a part that actually deals with the keyless works, is because it sits underneath this bridge that I'm putting on now. So you just need to remember to do that. This bridge goes on no problem at all. So we'll get it tightened down. And again, nothing really standing out here as far as issues go. We can continue the rebuild with the crown wheel and ratchet wheel. And as I said, these movements are actually quite simple, especially by movement standards. Sometimes they get really complicated and this one's not. This one's kind of mercifully straightforward. A little bit of oil here where the friction is. You know, this staking block is actually working just fine for reassembly. I'll have to note that in the future. If I end up working on one of these or a, a exceptionally small movement like this. I mean, the last tiny one that I worked on was really small, but bigger than this. Like I actually could use my my, my regular movement holder, even though it was all the way cinched down, it would grab it. And this one wasn't even close. Okay, let's get the ratchet wheel put into place now. Okay, there we go. And now we'll tighten this down. This one goes the regular threaded way, righty tighty. The one next to it didn't, if you noticed, it actually tightened by turning to the left. A lot of manufacturers were very kind and sort of marked the screws that were different so that you could tell. Sometimes they're a different color, sometimes they have three marks on the top. Okay, let's get the cannon pinion back on now. It just snaps right into place, no problem. And now we can continue with the keyless works. This is called the clutch wheel. And it engages with another part called the sliding clutch that we'll put on next. This became kind of the default way to do keyless works at some point. Uh, the vast majority of watches now use a system like this. If you go back in time, not even that far, just like to the 40s, you will see other systems um, that watch manufacturers use. And if you look to pocket watches, there was quite a few different ones. But for whatever reason, this one kind of became the industry standard. Maybe it's the best one. Maybe it's the most efficient. Maybe it's the cheapest to manufacture or some combination of those factors. I don't really know. Okay, so we can put the yoke in place now. As well as the setting lever. Wherever it goes. Yeah, right here. That looks right. A little bit more of this blue grease is going to go on the winding stem. And I got to say, this thing's just coming right back together. I'm quite hopeful that we'll be able to get it running just off of the service. Because it did seem like it had a little bit of dry oil and it did seem like it wanted to run. Motion works are up next. And in this case, that's just a couple of uh, wheels. There's one that's a intermediate wheel, and then this is the minute wheel. And let's not forget to put the, uh, the yoke spring in place. This one is often very difficult. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> you can see I'm using a black stick to hold that. Hey, that wasn't too bad at all, actually. Wow. That was really easy. Um, I used that that plastic stick to hold the uh, yoke in place in case it wants to fly off because I'm telling you, those little suckers are born to fly. They are one of the thickest springs. 
So you have to put a lot of tension on it. And if you kind of wind up that tension and then miss, <laughs> yeah, you're going to be on all fours looking around on the carpet with a, a flashlight and a magnet. Okay, now we can put the setting lever spring back in place. And with that, we can give this thing a test run. So let's get the pallet fork in place. And now we get kind of our first big moment of truth is, did this thing just need a service to get running? Once the pallet fork's in place, there's only one more part to install and that's the balance. Okay, pallet fork carefully in place. And now we can screw it down. Okay, so here's the balance and let's see if this little watch will spring back to life. Everything's a tight fit with this watch. Even the balance doesn't really have room to sit in here very well. So we have to kind of carefully put it into place and make sure that everything's seated. And as you can see, once it's in there, then everything lines up, but it is a tough fit for sure. Okay, let's see if it'll start. It does look like it wants to. Now I haven't screwed down the balance bridge yet. Boy, is this in place? It, it really wants to start, but it won't. Oh, see? Oh, almost. That does not look right though. It almost will go, but it won't quite, huh? You know what? Let's take a look at this balance wheel. So this is the bottom end of it. And as you can see, there's a nice point there at the bottom. That's for the balance staff. Now let's take a look at the other side. Oh no. Yep, it's gone. You can see it hidden there in the springs. We'll get a better look down the line here. But uh, yeah, that balance staff is broken. That's why the watch would run sometimes. And that is not good news because getting a new balance staff on one of these is, I've never done that on something this small. I have done it on a few bigger watches, but let's dig in and see what we need to do here. The first thing we need to do is take apart the balance. The balance itself is actually made of a bunch of different parts. There's the balance bridge. This is called the balance spring, or it's also often called the hair spring. And I need to very carefully remove that without damaging it. As you can imagine, that's gotta be probably the most delicate part on the entire watch. So I'm gonna set that aside. Now we've got that apart, I can show you. So there's the big spike on the bottom, right? That is the pivot itself. And take a look at the other side. Nothing, it just comes to kind of a conical point and then it's gone. And that's because it's either worn away or broken away and you can see the difference here as well. So that's why this watch wasn't running and also why it kind of ran a little bit for my family member because it can kind of run that way. Now, if you look here, that middle part is riveted into this into place here. There's three parts that we're looking at. There's the wheel, there's a balance staff, and then as you'll see, we'll take off what's called the roller table. But the balance staff is actually riveted into place, meaning the metal is pressed into place. So take a deep breath. Now I've got this tool that is used to take apart the rest of the balance, okay? This is called a Platax tool. And um, it's really, really good for doing that. So the first thing we need to do is remove the roller table. And that's that part on top. And that needs that is stuck onto the balance, uh, excuse me, onto the balance staff is what I meant to say. And it needs to come off. So it gets held into place and then we can use this little tiny pusher to push just on that very top tip. And then it should release the balance. Let's see if we can do it. Uh, excuse me, release the roller table here. So that part needs to push down like this and then it should release itself. Let's see, yeah, it didn't happen. Okay, well I've got another tool that I can use. When in doubt, there's always another tool. So this one is another way to remove the roller. And basically what it does is it just creates a wedge on either side and you position the roller in between and then squeeze the ends of this thing. And it should just sort of gently remove that. But as you can see, it does not want to come off. It's really stuck on there. I mean, it's been on there since probably the seventies when this watch was made. Let's give it a good, oh no. 
okay, that didn't feel right. So it kind of clipped off. It, it came off in one chunk. And as you can see, that balance staff, it actually just broke off. Now, there's the bottom of it with the fresh metal inside now. And there's the top of it still in. That's supposed to have come out. Well, okay, the good news is it's not a big deal that it's broken because that's the part that we're going to replace anyway. But I have to find a way to get that out of there. And it's so small. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. Well, at least we do have the roller removed so we can continue with getting the rest of the balance staff separated from the balance wheel. Again, this is riveted into place and so we need to break the rivet. So this same tool that I used before, this Platex tool, does that as well. And you'll see how it works. So you put it into place and then this part comes down and uh, is a stabilizer for the whole wheel and then you can use one of these pushers. Now you do need to use a little tap of a hammer just once, that's it. That's all you need to do and that'll break the rivet and uh, you'll be left with just the balance wheel. So take a look here, there's the balance wheel, no longer with a balance staff in the middle. And I can show you the other half of the balance staff that didn't get broken off and there it is. So it's also been removed now as well. But take a look, <laughs> this is the new balance staff. It's so small that you can barely even tell that it's in the bag. I mean, how do they do shipping weight for something like this? It's just ludicrous, but there it is. That's a brand new balance staff that we now need to rivet into place and also reinstall all the other parts that go around it that we had already taken off. As you can see, it fits into place here right into the wheel, but it won't stay in and you don't use glue or anything like that to do it. So this is how we put this into place. I'm gonna take a different tool. This is uh, a staking set. And what I'm looking for is the smallest hole that will still fit the balance staff so that it'll, be held steady to give us a platform from which to rivet. That one looks like it's getting there. Can it go all the way down here? Wow, it actually fits in the second smallest hole on this whole thing. Okay, the smallest hole is the only one it won't go in. And once you find one that it won't fit, you go one back from there. So it'll fit here in this, I mean, I never thought I would even use that end of this tool, it's so tiny but there we go. So that fits well. And now I can place the wheel over the top of it and that'll set us up for riveting. Now I have to use punches here, but I have never used this tiny of punches before, but I do have them in my kit. I'm really glad that the kit I brought had the full amount. And as you can see, what I do is I do three or four little taps on the top and then give it a quarter turn and then tap it again. And the way this works is, these punches are domed at the bottom. So what they're doing is they're pushing the metal of the balance staff against the edges of this wheel. And that's how we rivet it into place. And what we'll do is we'll do a run with the domed one and then we'll switch over to a flat punch. And the flat punch will then spread out the rivet further and secure it to the wheel so that they kind of become one. So let's take a look and see if it's holding. Good, good, so that looks nice. So I think that's good to go. Now I do have one other little project here though, remember, is I need to somehow get the rest of that old balance staff out. So I'm gonna use a punch to just press it down with my hand and let's see if that actually worked. Otherwise, I don't know how the heck I'm gonna get that balance staff out of there. Oh, it did actually push it down. That's fantastic. You can see on the bottom there, it's now sticking out the bottom, which means that it's been loosened. And can I take it out? Yes, there we go. How fantastic is that? I actually did manage to safely take out the rest of that broken balance staff. So we're back to business there. And we've got the new balance staff riveted into place as well as the, uh, the old one ready to go. So now what I need to do is I need to reinstall this roller and that should just press on, but this one's actually quite difficult too. But as you can see, it is going on. And of course you, as you might imagine, you have to be so careful with this. There we go. Because if you're a little bit off center, you'll just break the tip off of that again and be right back to square one. But as you can see, we did get the 
roller back into place. And uh, so that should be all good to go. The last thing that we need to do to reassemble this part of the balance is to put the balance spring back into place. And as you can see, this is quite a delicate operation. The spring and the tip of that balance staff are two of the more delicate parts on a watch. So you just need to make sure that the punch is of the appropriate size and that it's aligned properly because if it's too big, it'll bend the spring. And if it's too small, you'll break the tip of the balance staff. But just some finger pressure um, will be enough to put it into place. And we have done exactly that. So now after it, putting it back onto the balance bridge, we can get our big moment of truth and see if this thing is going to run. I really hope it does. Let's get it seated back into place now and give it a little twist. Okay. Oh, 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 it stopped. Don't stop. Oh, oh, I think it's going. It is still going. It is running again. Wow. We actually did it. <laughs> I kind of can't believe it. I mean, <laughs> a riveting that thing was so tiny and I kind of felt like it might not work. And look at it go. Wow, incredible. Um, yeah, I'm really, really happy that I was able to get this one going again. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little surprised, um, but yeah, I'll take it for sure. Now we need to oil up the jewels here on the train wheels because this job is not done yet. That was the hard part though. <laughs> and we got it running. And so now we need to take some time here to make sure that these uh, jewels are properly lubricated so that the watch will run for a good long time. And also these help it uh, reach peak performance. It's not just about longevity with the lubrication. That is part of it, but it is also about it running better. You know, if you uh, service a watch like this and neglect to oil anything on it and then uh, measure how well it does and then go back and oil it, you'll see a marked improvement. You really will. Okay, so now uh, there's a cap jewel here on top of the escape wheel. And it's a little bit weird because it has this um, the spring on the top, the shock protection, but it's like not meant to be removed. I used to actually just remove those and uh, I finally got some good advice that said, hey, you don't actually need to take those all the way off. You can kind of slide them out of the way. And I'll tell you that did, that does work a lot better. So the process for these is remove them put them in a solvent, take a quick look just to see. And I'm going to try to show you, do you see how there's still some debris in the middle of that jewel? That's dried on oil. And that can actually sap the performance and the longevity at the same time. So we want to remove that. So what I'm going to do here is take it and I'm going to take a piece of peg wood, which is just, uh, you know, it's just wood, right? That doesn't really leave too much debris and that you can just sort of whittle to uh, whatever need you happen to have. And I can manually clean the top of that jewel and then put it back into the solvent here until it's good and clean before we actually start putting the lubricant on it. And just taking a quick look, you can see how much better that is with all the, uh, the gunk out of the middle. Now I can take some oil and place a dot of it just directly in the middle and then carefully pick it up, flip it over, and then set it back into place. And then what happens is that that jewel will just suspend that oil directly above the pivot hole. You can actually see it suspended. If you take a look there, there's a circle of oil right above it. And that's exactly what you wanna see. Now I can gently uh, put this shock protector back into place and that jewel will be done. As you can see, this is quite a process though. I mean, this was just for this one jewel here. Now, not all of them have shock protected capsules on them like this one, but, uh, but this one does. Okay. All set into place. Speaking of shock protected capsules, there's another one that we need to do. And that is on the top of the balance. There's also one on the bottom and these require the same procedure. It's a little bit more, um, oh no. Okay, the jewel just flew out. Where did, okay, I got it, I got it, don't worry. <laughs> it, it fell down where the balance wheel goes and actually stopped it for a second, but um, no big deal. Survived, saved. As long as it's still in the general vicinity, I'll find it, it's when it falls on the ground that that's when things are a problem. But at any rate, these are a little bit more complicated because instead of just a cap jewel, there's actually 
two parts. There's a setting and a cap jewel, but that doesn't really make it that much harder. And I'll do the same thing. I'll use this uh, peg wood just to clean off any of the oil. And there actually is quite a bit of dried on oil on this as well. So that would have been hampering performance. That kind of thing won't really stop the watch unless it's an extreme case, but it can certainly slow it down. All right, again, a little drop of oil there. Now this one's a little different though because I'm gonna take the setting and I'm just gonna place it on it here and then capillary action will just sort of suck it into place. And this makes it actually a lot easier because <laughs> when you move it around, the oil is suspended automatically where the other way, like if you touch that cap jewel up against the edge of a part, the oil will smear all over and you'll have to start over again. Okay, and there we go. All the oils back in place. And after finish oiling, let's see how this thing is performing. Hey, pretty good actually. 258, 260 degrees of amplitude and a great rate, but the beat error is way off. So after fiddling with it for a long time, it, there's not a super easy way to adjust beat error on this. I got it down to a much more acceptable 0.7. For an older watch like this, anything under one is kind of what I'm aiming for. For a newer watch, you wanna get it to like 0.1 or 0.2, but 0.7 for this one is totally acceptable in my book. And it's keeping good time with good amplitude and I couldn't be happier about it. And that means that we can go down the stretch here on the final assembly, you just need to put on the dial, the hands, get this thing cased up, and we will have a finished project. I have to say these small, small movements are very, very stressful to work on. And um, I'm glad that this one came to me a bit later in my watchmaking journey rather than earlier because it would have been way above my, my pay grade as it were. I did find a use for the stupid little tiny uh, movement holder here. It's at least holding the movement flat enough for me to put the hands back on. So <laughs> how's that going for it? You can see the hour hand will go on first. You don't have to be too particular about where the hour hand goes on because you can just set the time. So like I moved it up to midnight here, but you do have to be very particular about where the minute hand goes because it is gonna be linked to the hour hand for lack of a better term. And of course you want it, you want them to uh, be in sync properly. So you want to get that lined up just right. The little tiny adjustments. And then I can use my hand press tool here to secure it just like that. There's no seconds hand for this uh, watch, as I mentioned before. So we don't have to worry about that. And we can just go about casing this thing up. We'll start by putting it back in the back of the case. And then a quick air blower here just to make sure that there's no dust or debris on the bottom side of the crystal or on the dial. And now we can put this really cool crystal. That has to be one of the neatest features about this watch. They don't do that anymore. And uh, it really does add something elegant to it. And it just snaps back into place like that. Super easy. And we've got a finished Tiny, probably the tiniest watch I'll ever work on. <laughs> Rolex ladies watch from the 70s and it came out beautiful. A nice little cleanup didn't hurt it either, but really the best part about it is it's running again and it's actually running quite well. I am sort of shocked and really happy that I was able to get this one back together. Uh, the sheer size makes it difficult to work on, but having to do complex stuff like the riveting and everything, boy. That was a bit of a journey. Thanks so much for coming with me for that journey. I'm really glad that you decided to stop by and work on the smallest watch I've ever worked on with me. If you want to find me on Instagram, you can do so. It's wristwatch underscore revival. You can stop by and say hi. I post stuff, some stuff from like maybe my collection or um, some of the project updates and stuff like that over there. And it's always nice to say hi. Once again, thanks so much for hanging out. We'll see you next time.